Hi everyone, Krista Cowan here with another episode of The Barefoot Genealogist. Today we are talking about how to invite others to take an Ancestry DNA test and how that might help you in making more discoveries through your Ancestry DNA match list. So we'll start by covering why you might want to invite others to test and then I will share some of my tips for how I've been able to get my own family members, uh, distant and close, to take a DNA test. So let's talk about the whys first. The more first, second, and third cousins that you have that have tested, the more distant discoveries you can make with your ancestry DNA results. So I have tested both of my parents and they both came up in my ancestry DNA match list as my parents and I came up on their match list as their child. So that's great. That enables me to sort out my maternal and paternal matches. Now, I can't inherit anything my parents didn't give me, and because both my parents have tested, technically, I didn't even need to take a test, except I was curious. But, um, but the idea is I work mostly with their test results because I have a complete generation tested. Now, if you are the oldest living generation, that's where having some additional people tested comes into play. So, out of my four grandparents, one of them is still living, so I have tested her. That's my dad's mom. What that enables me to do is to sort out my dad's matches. So anything my dad has in common with his mom uh, most likely comes from her side of the family tree. Anything that he has that she doesn't most likely comes from his father's side of the family tree. So by testing her, uh, I was able to start to sort out my dad's matches. Now my mom, her parents are both deceased. So I tested her sister because that gives me more of my grandparents' DNA to work with but her sister doesn't help me sort out the matches at all. So it wasn't until um, we tested or invited to test uh, some of my mom's first cousins, we actually target tested, which is where I picked someone and, and gave them a test and invited them to test and to share those results with me. Um, we, we target tested a few of her first cousins. Some of them took it on their own, and I'll talk in just a minute about how that uh, came about. And then uh, as we branch out, we're able to test some second and third cousins as well. So by testing my mom's first cousin on her mom's side of the family, we've been able to say any matches that that cousin has in common with my mom and or her sister, that most likely comes from my grandmother's side of the family. That leaves us with my grandfather's side of the family, which actually brings us to the next bullet point. If you have half relationships with anyone, so if you have half siblings or half first cousins, having them tested uh, is gonna be particularly useful to help you sort your matches. So for example, my mother has a half sister. We actually discovered that through DNA testing, that's a whole nother story. But uh, this half sister and my mom have a dad in common. And what that means then is, is that any match that my mom has in common with this half sibling is gonna be on her dad's side of the family tree. So it makes it again, easy to start to sort out matches. Now that's really easy to see or to wrap your head around when you're talking about some of these close in relationships, parents, grandparents, right? But then what about second or third cousins? Well, a second cousin is someone with whom you share a common set of great-grandparents. So again, if I test a second cousin and I have matches in common with that person, what that's going to help me do is to determine which set of great-grandparents that the other matches most likely connect on. So the idea is what we're looking to do is prove our family history, right? prove the paper trails that we've researched, I've got decades and decades and decades of family history research that's been done by myself and other members of my family. We've amassed this huge family tree, but the research is only as accurate as the researcher who did it, right? And all of us make mistakes. I made tons of mistakes in my teenage years when I was just getting started and really had no clue what I was doing. And slowly I've been cleaning some of those things up um, over time. DNA has kind of accelerated that because I'm able to see exactly where I connect and don't connect with different people and it's able, enabling me to do that. 
I also have brick walls, and I've talked about this before, so I won't spend a lot of time on it, but you'll notice here John O'Brien has this little blank arrow next to his name. Everybody else has a dark arrow. His is kind of transparent there. It's because I don't know for certain who his parents are. He is my brick wall. Well, with the help of DNA testing, okay, so my mom has that half sibling in, in common with her dad. I've looked at matches that they have in common. I've looked at matches that they have in common with their first cousins, who are the grandchildren of Walter and Ada. And now I've looked at matches that they have in common with the, the third and fourth cousins, who are Joan's descendants. And basically what that's left me with is this group of about seven or eight matches who, who match all of those Woodruff first cousins, who are not Woodruffs or Nickums or Joneses. And therefore, they are likely going to be O'Brien's. And so it's enabling me to start to build out a family tree for John. I am fairly certain that I have his great-grandparents identified because of shared matches, even though I haven't yet for certain identified his parents. So again, one of the reasons why we want other people to test is so that we can start to use our DNA match list to prove connections, to prove out our research, to make new discoveries in our family history. That's why I do it. Um, I, you may have different reasons for taking a DNA test, but that's super useful. So then the problem is, what if you have no first or second or third cousin DNA matches? Well, I didn't either for a long time. And so I actually went out and invited people to test. Now, in the beginning, I would actually purchase tests and hand them out. Um, and I, that becomes a little cost prohibitive, let's be honest. And so now what I've done is I've actually discovered some ways to encourage people to test and to share those results with me where I don't have to pay for it. So here are just a few of the methods that I use to invite or encourage people to test. The first thing that I would recommend is to reach out to some of those more distant cousins. And by distant cousins in this instance, I mean second, third, fourth cousins. Um, and reach out to them on Facebook. I have found that uh, if I send them a message, um, usually what I'll do is I'll say something along the lines of, you know, hi, this is who I am. Are you the granddaughter of John Smith? Because if so, then we're third cousins. And I do a lot of family history research and I'd love to share some of that with you. And almost in every instance, I think I've had maybe two out of hundreds in, in the years, almost in every instance, they will send me, they will immediately send me a friend request. So they get the message on Facebook, they send me a friend request. And then once I have friended two or three people in the family, the, the rest of the family typically follows suit and friends me. I have now on my Facebook page, probably about 500 or so, 550 of my Facebook friends are actually distant cousins. People that I have reached out to in order to connect with them, in order to share information about our family history. Now, most of these people are not super into family history like I am. Some of them have a casual or a passing interest in family history. Some of them are amused by the novelty of connecting with some third or fourth cousin. Some of them genuinely are interested in family history, but don't have the time or the skills or, uh, you know, to, to dive into it at the level that I do. And so they follow me or they friend me on Facebook because they know that I will share information. And so then the next step is once you've collected some of these cousins on Facebook um, is to post about family history or post about your DNA discoveries. Now, don't do it all the time. One of the things I've discovered is that for people who aren't really into genealogy, like so many of us are, they, um, they get kind of eye rolly if we post too much about it, right? And so the deal is, is I just post, you know, a few times a month, maybe two or three times a month about specifically about uh, genealogy or specifically about DNA. What that's done is it has set me up as the expert in the family. I'm the go-to person and all of my Facebook friends know that. And so they're, they'll come to me and they'll say, oh, you know, I know you're into this genealogy thing. Can you tell me about this? Or I heard about this DNA test. Or you, you talked about this at one point. Or, you know, the, they come to me asking questions and it allows me 
to start to inform um, some of the decisions that they're going to make around DNA testing right, or around um, family history in general, or I can share that information back with them. So post about your family history discoveries, post about your DNA discoveries. Um, maybe even every once in a while you can um, put out a little bit of a plea. Now, you have to be um, a little bit subtle about it. In my instance, um, I posted once about the John O'Brien brick wall, and I just said, oh, I wish I had more Woodruff cousins who had DNA tested because that would really help us with this brick wall. And sure enough, within about six months, several more Woodruff cousins had DNA tested. Now, I don't know if that was a direct... Um, directly related to the fact that I had posted, but I put that out into the universe and out into the, the Facebook world of my cousins. And the result was, or at least the ultimately what happened was more of them tested. So lots of different ways you can use Facebook for that to kind of uh, nudge people and, and kind of direct them to, uh, and explain to them what you're doing and, and why you're doing it. Now, the other thing that I would recommend or the other way I would recommend using Facebook if you're not following Ancestry on Facebook, I'd encourage you to do that. Um, it is a Facebook page, and it really clearly is branded that it's the, the corporate page. So you want to make sure you join a page, not a group. There's lots of Facebook groups out there. Um, as far as I know, there is only one group run by Ancestry, and it's a closed group. So that's um, if you're joining a group, <laughs> that is not, you don't want to join a group. That's not run by Ancestry. Ancestry is a Facebook page and you just like it. Okay, so that's the difference between groups and pages. You join a group, you like a page. Look for the Ancestry Facebook page so that you can like it. And that corporate page, anytime there's a sale on DNA or some kind of a promotion, we're going to put that on the Facebook page. Then you can take that and you can share it to your Facebook wall, which then shares it with all of your friends. So anytime there's a sale, that's a really great way to say, hey, you know what, cousins, if you've ever been interested in taking an Ancestry DNA test, now is the time because they're on sale for X. That said, uh, Ancestry is actually running a sale right now for a few extra days. I think it runs until the 14th, maybe the 15th. Don't quote me on that. I probably should have checked that out before I went on air. Um, but the idea is then you're promoting that sale and encouraging them to purchase that test. The other thing you can do, and this is what I did in the beginning, is you can, every time there's a sale, you can stock up. So I remember, I won't, okay, I will tell you, I bought, a, I won't give you an exact number. I bought a lot of DNA kits uh, at a sale once and just had a stockpile of them so that every time I went to Arkansas to visit family or to California to visit family, or every time um, one of my cousins sent me a message on Facebook saying, hey, I was thinking about taking this DNA test, well, then I could offer it to them. And in some cases, I just gave it to them, and in some cases I just said, well, you know what, I bought too many at the last sale, and I just happened to have one, and here's how much I paid for it, so if you just want to pay me for that, that would be great. And so then I'm able to facilitate that um, testing a little bit easier. It kind of lowers the barriers for people uh, who might be a little hesitant um, about testing. Now, one of the things that you need to be aware of is that every person who takes an Ancestry DNA test has to activate their own kit. Um, we feel really strongly about the fact that privacy and control of DNA should be in the control of the person whose DNA kit it is. So it doesn't matter if I paid for the test, I don't own somebody else's DNA. So they're going to take the test, they're going to activate it. Um, the good news is, if we're related, they're going to show up on my match list, and that is still useful for me. I can still use the shared matches feature to work with their DNA results and my DNA results in order to make some discoveries. Even better if they share their results with me. And anyone can do that. They can share their results from their DNA settings from their account to my account. Uh, I've got a whole video about that. It's called Activating and Managing DNA Tests. So if you want to go watch that to see the screenshots and the mechanics of how that works, you can. But whether they share their test with me or not, um, I still have really great discoveries that I can make using the shared matches feature. So uh, that's how that works. Now, um, another way to get um, people tested. So for example, uh, my dad and I, we spend every Sunday night together on the phone. He lives uh, in a different state than I do. And we spend about two or three hours together every Sunday night going through his DNA match list and 
figuring out who these people are and how they're connected to us. And it's a lot of fun. And one of the things that we've discovered is that, um, you know, he'll have like a third cousin match pop up. And once, once we figure out the relationship, sometimes we realize, you know what, this person's grandmother and my grandmother were first cousins and surely they knew each other because our family has had family reunions forever um, uh, until about the mid 90s. They were happening for, for 50 or 60 years. And so you know, these, the cousins all knew each other. They all interacted with each other. They all had really good relationships with each other. And yet somehow now here we are two or three generations later and the families, they just are disconnected. So it's just kind of, it's kind of amusing to me and a little bit sad that these first cousins of my grandma now have children and grandchildren that I've never even heard of. And so when we figure out these relationships, it's super exciting. Well, one of the things that you can do is you can actually do some of that descendancy research now. Go look at all of your grandma's first cousins and figure out who their children and grandchildren are. And one of the things that you might discover is that some of the members of the family that you know already might already have relationships with that people, with those people. So for example, my aunt, my dad's sister, who still lives in California, who still lives right by my grandma, has better relationships with some of the California family than we do because we moved away from California when I was 13. And so she has relationships with some of these second and third cousins that I don't even know. And so by talking to her about family history and talking to her about who in the family she knows, I've been able to reconnect with lots of people that way. So the idea is if you have an aunt or um, I have my, my grandpa has a sister still living. I have um, my intention is this Christmas to reach out to her and to reestablish that relationship. Um, so there's you've got these people in your life that you know well or that you used to know and you maybe have lost touch with that you can reconnect with and they may have more far-reaching um, relationships in the family than you do so it allows you to connect with people that way and it's a great excuse to reconnect with family members that maybe for whatever reason life has caused you to drift apart a little bit my final suggestion is just to reach out directly to people so as you do this descendancy research right as you find the children and grandchildren of grandma's first cousins um, or great grandma's first cousins, then you can use services online. Um, I use whitepages.com a lot. I use just uh, do Google searches, um, newspapers.com. Uh, I have found more wedding and birth announcements uh, in newspapers.com and military announcements and obituaries that connect me with um, you know, surviving people who live in a specific town and then I can go look them up and I can find their phone number. Uh, sometimes I can find their email address or their snail mail address. So if I've reached out via Facebook, which is usually my, my preferred first line of contact, um, and I don't get a response, and usually that could be for any number of reasons. It might not be because they're ignoring you. It could just be because um, the messages from people who aren't your friends on Facebook go into an other folder. And a lot of people don't check that folder or even know that it exists. Some people only do Facebook uh, on a mobile device and the messaging service for mobile devices on Facebook is a separate app that some people don't have installed. And so there's a lot of reasons why somebody might not respond to you on Facebook. I give them a few weeks, sometimes I'll give them a couple of months, but then um, I might reach out directly to them via email if I can get my hands on their email address or via phone, or sometimes via snail mail. Um, actually, just write them a letter that just explains who you are, but then make sure in that letter you give any electronic communication options to them that you have, right? You can give them your mailing address and your phone number if you're comfortable with that, but give them your email address, give them the URL of your Facebook page so that they can um, find you on Facebook so that they can connect with you that way. Well, those are some of my best tips. Uh, I have found it to be super successful because of that. We've now got tons of second and third and fourth cousins who've tested. We're able to start to sort out all of our matches. It is very, very rare anymore that I get a DNA match that I can at least figure out which branch of the family tree they fit on. They may not have a tree. I may not have a clue who they are, but I can tell you, you know what? They're probably a descendant of this great, 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 great grandparent couple in my family tree. 
uh, and that's because of all the other people that we have tested. Hopefully that's useful for you. If you have questions about this process, feel free to leave them in the comments here on the YouTube channel. I do monitor those. I will answer those uh, as I come across them. And I am putting together the January, February, and March calendar for 2018 for video topics. So if you have a topic you would like discussed, please feel free to email me at ask at Ancestry.com with those suggestions. Until next time, this is Krista Cowan. Have fun climbing your family tree.